afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Sarah Josie, and I'm the Wellness at Work Coordinator, if I haven't yet met you. Uh, and this is one of many uh, different workshops, events that have taken place throughout October. Um, and we do still have a few things on the schedule, so take a look at, at what's on the schedule until the end of the month, including our spooktacular space contest, uh, where you can decorate your office space with your colleagues uh, and submit your photos to win a prize. So today we're really excited. We have three researchers here joining us um, and they're gonna be talking about the concept of well-being, and they've uh, prepared a panel discussion for us. Um, so we're really excited and hope that you'll join me in welcoming, welcoming them today. Okay, thank you, Sarah. My name is Peter Hausdorf and uh, I think because I'm the oldest panel member, I got elected to be the chair of the, uh, of the session. So thank you for coming and thank you for people who are connecting through our uh, live streaming. So that's, uh, that's pretty cool. Um, so uh, what we have here, we have uh, Grace Ewells um, on the far right there. And Grace is a PhD candidate and she specializes in stress and trauma, um, particularly at work. And then we have Leanne Song Hing who specializes in a whole area, range of areas related to well-being, um, one in particular being inequality at work and the impact of inequality on well-being. And I also do a range of research related to, uh, to well-being. So we're hoping that uh, we can answer some of your questions. Um, you know, some we might not be, be able to answer, but we can have maybe a good discussion. And we really do want this to be more like a conversation. Um, so as before we get started, I would like to kind of know who we have here. So how many of you are students? Just put your hands up. So a couple of students. So welcome. Staff. A whole bunch of staff. Okay, great. And any faculty? So no faculty. Okay, so that's, uh, that's cool. Um, so thank you. And I don't know about our web audience, but hopefully um, you represent. Oh, is there any other, anyone else from, that's not in one of those three groups? Okay. Okay, great. Um, so as I said, our goal for this session is for us to share some of our perspectives on our research on well-being and to have a conversation. So we kind of loosely structured this around four questions. And what, uh, what we thought we would do is ask the first question and then we'll give you sort of our view on it and then we'll open up the floor to discussion. Okay, and then we'll go to the next question and whatnot. And we're thinking about 10 minutes per each question, so that's about 40 minutes. And that should leave us open for a few general discussion questions at the end, if there's anything that, uh, that you want to talk about, okay? Um, so the first question that, uh, that we had is, um, how would each of us define well-being? So maybe I'll, I'll start with one of my panel members who wants to just grab the mic okay. and, uh, right. and get us going. So hi, everyone. Uh, personally, I would define well-being as the fine line between being engaged and fulfilled in the various aspects of your life, um, but that this engagement and this fulfillment doesn't come at the expense of your values or your physical and mental well-being and your mental health. Um, so it's not to say that you're not tired at the end of the day, but that the fulfillment that you get from your various roles helps to reinvigorate you and give you resources that lead you to feel fulfilled and then engage in the next day. So that's how I would define well-being. I'm going to hear your speech next. You want me to go next? <laughs> um, so, you know, in answering the questions, I, I did a mix of um, some of the research and also then my own view. So this one I sort of started with my own view. And it's a little bit related to what, what Grace just said. And I, I said, for me, it's a sense of self in which you understand yourself relatively well and feel capable of meeting your goals, demands, and also feel connected to others. So it's kind of almost like a self-appraisal. Um, but not a critical self-appraisal, just understanding yourself as, as well as you can and how you feel capable to meet the challenges of work, work and life. Well, I guess not too surprising, my, not too surprising my answer's not that different from uh, either Grace or Peter. Um, I guess one thing I would say is that I think that uh, well-being and how people think of well-being is probably going to be uh, culturally dependent. So in different contexts, people would understand well-being differently. Um, in the literature, a big way that people understand well-being, and a lot of people study it, is um, the more positive affect people feel, so like happiness, and the less negative affect that they feel, as well as people's general life satisfaction, or in the workplace, um, level of job satisfaction. And while I think um, good insights can be gained from looking at well-being that way, I don't think it's the be-all and end-all. Um, and so, like Grace and Peter, I really think it ha has more to do with people's sense of fulfillment and purpose. 
Um, and when I look um, at what aspects of people's lives then give them that sense of fulfillment and purpose, a lot of it does have to do with a sense of mastery or effic efficacy, feeling like we have some control over things, um, as well as having a good self-acceptance um, and positive relationships with others. Yours is way more thorough than, than mine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to step up for a question too. Um, so what we'd like to do is open it up for questions. Uh, there's a couple things that make this a little more challenging is that this is being recorded. So we'd like to have you um, speak into the, into the microphone so I can bring that around, just if that's okay. I know that makes it a little bit more awkward. Um, and Grace has agreed to time for us yeah. to make sure we stay on track. So does anybody have a question or comment that they would like to start us off? All right, here we go, perfect. How do you think wellness has changed over like generations or the concept of wellness? Okay, so how has wellness changed over generations with the concept of wellness? So the nice thing about being chair is I can just look at my panel and, and, have, them, and have them start. Um, so I think people's expectations um, for it have changed a lot. I bet um, it wasn't much of the conversation, um, you know, centuries ago or decades ago. I think to some degree, you know, people talk about first world problems, right? So to the extent to which we can be concerned about whether or not um, are we as psychologically as healthy as we can possibly be um, reflects the luxury that we have that we're not, you know, fa facing off hunger or starvation. Um, that our basic needs are being met. Um, I think there's, I think there's more navel gazing um, within our society now, and so I'm speaking from a North American perspective. Um, and so questions about, you know, am I happy? What makes me happy? Um, what can I do in order to, you know, have more meaning in my life? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think people were as concerned um, about it. Yeah, in decades past. I think in a lot of work contexts too, uh, previously wellness really focused on physical health and well-being, and our conversation has now really shifted towards the, the social aspects and mental health and well-being. So I think that's a really important part that we are now coming towards having that conversation in different contexts. Um, some workplaces are more progressive than others in terms of looking at more of a holistic view of well-being, um, but thankfully we're moving that direction of try to understand it from more of a multifaceted perspective rather than a focus on physical health and well-being. I think, I think the only thing that I would add is that, uh, so I think that, that we talk, we're talking about it more, which is a good thing, and, we, and we're able to talk about it more. Mm -hmm. you know? When I was growing up in high school, which is a long time ago, um, social anxiety was never discussed. So you may have felt social in, you know, stressed in social situations, particularly at school, but no one ever talked about it. You didn't even know what it was. You know, no one really ever brought it out into the open. So you may have felt that way, but you didn't, you didn't know what it was and you didn't, people weren't talking about it. And so you ended up just coping, right? You were just forced to, to cope with it. And I think now we recognize that that's one strategy, but there are other strategies and we can seek resources and we have a better understanding of those things. So I think the conversation um, is helping a lot in terms of people understanding themselves better and figuring out ways to, to work through those things. Other questions or comments? Okay, perfect. Um, do you think that you need like outside of work well-being in order to have workplace well-being or are they like how independent are the two I guess? Okay, that's a great question. Do you guys want me to start or? So I'll start just because I've done quite a bit of work in the area of some will call work-life work -life balance. Um, there was a theory for quite some time that the domains were completely separate. Um, but I think we all kind of know that's not, that's not the case, right? If you're up all night with a sick child and you come into work next day and you're already physically exhausted, you're not necessarily going to be at your best. Um, so then there was a theory of spillover, so that, you know, s stress affects spillover between the two domains. And I think now we're sort of at a point where we see that everything, everything crosses over. So you can have a really good day and you can take that good feeling when you go home and take it into tough situations at home. Um, and the same thing can happen at home, you know. So I think it is integrated and I think we have to recognize that we are whole people and that, you know, things that happen at home come to work and things that happen at work go home. And um, 
And I think the fact that we need to recognize that then can also help in communications with, say, your manager or coworkers or your partner. You know, so that'd be my sense is that that we are seeing. You know, you're a whole person, and you bring you know all of yourself to work, and you also take all of yourself home. So I don't know what you guys have to add. Okay. Um, so I would say that the cross relationships that part of its affect. Right, so if, if you're unhappy in one realm, then you're gonna likely to bring that mood and, and recreate that in, in another realm. Um, but part of it's also skills, right? So, um, okay, so I, I'm a professor in, in the psychology department and the feedback that I get from students often is um, that they appreciate how patient I am. And I am not naturally a patient person. So I see the feedback and I actually get surprised that anyone's describing me as patient. Um, but you know, how could I have possibly developed this skill? I've got uh, a very challenging six-year-old. And so I think you know, if, I can, if I can deal with him, then I, I've learned uh, to, to have more patience. So we can develop skills in one context that then carry over to the other that help us to function in the, in the other context better. So that's another way that work and life interact with each other. Yeah, I think just building on that too, on the both points, is we're really looking at more of this facilitation con concept now in research. So how do the skills and the experiences that you're having in either role positively impact or spill over into the other, um, which is a really new kind of concept and very interesting. Um, but really it builds on the idea that you are a whole person, you do have these experiences, and we aren't able to shut it off. Um, so especially in different contexts where that, that rigidity, rigidity is still present um, between work and family roles, it's really important that we start to break down those, those barriers and really see ourselves as whole people um, in order to experience the benefit of well-being and the research that we're seeing coming out now. Maybe just a, a final note on that. One, I just, as we were talking, I remembered a, a situation where I had a really bad day at work. I think I got a rejection letter um, for an article I submitted, so it was a bad day. I was still trying to get tenure. And uh, I got home from work and my daughter, who was probably about six at the time, just, you know, gave me a big hug, was so happy to see me. And so, and it kind of wiped out the bad effects of the day. So it's not just that, they, that we carry over the effect of one to the other, it's that they can actually alter, you know, they can affect it, right? So, and that seemed to wipe out, you know, um, didn't change the fact that I had these things that happened that weren't that pleasant at work, but it made me feel a whole lot better at the end of the day. So I think that's another part of it. Um, are we okay for time to keep on this one? Uh, sure, we can take one more question. One more question? The students are carrying the load here, people. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, so, my question was about the fiscal restraints of focus on well being and um, how do you change the attitudes of tenured people that think that? these types of things are a waste of time and money because a lot of your research focuses obviously on the balance between things but and whole personhood um, but how does that work if you're not in a position to actually influence that kind of rhetoric in your workplace okay i'm gonna get a lot of exercise today <laughs> Um, so I, I'm not sure that I, kn I know exactly where this question is coming from, but um, to the extent that people uh, think that something is an organizational um, imperative um, because it directly affects the bottom line um, or worker productivity, well-being does have these consequences. So people's um, sense of well-being is closely related to their physical well-being um, when people have too much stress, um, they get burnt out, they're gonna be absent from work more, they're going to not be as productive at work, they're gonna be um, more likely to have negative work relationships and conflict. Um, and all of these things can affect people's productivity, their commitment to the workplace. If you're miserable at work, you don't wanna stay there, you can have higher intentions to turn over and then actually be more likely to turn over. And all of these things are very impactful for the bottom line. Maybe I'll just give you an example. So also in our, in, in our profession of IO psychology, in addition to doing research, we obviously do a lot of practice and work with organizations. And a number of years ago, I was working with a, like a fast food organization and they really didn't have much in the way of human resource policies. So you know they were kind of an emerging company. And, um, and so we were asked to sort of build a human resources program for them. It's a franchise organization. 
And we kind of, and we expected that the franchisees would be like you, you know, like you said, that's it's a fast food organization. You know, they they pay minimum wage. Um, you know, they have tight margins. And um, and so, well, how can we convince them that you know, taking care of their employees, managing a good operation, right, listening to their employees, how can we convince them that this is actually going to be good for them? And so, as Leanne said, you know, we did a turnover exercise, and we asked them what the cost of their turnover was and had them go through an exercise. So just the cost of turnover. So just when you lose someone, you have to replace that person. It takes your time, right? You've got to recruit. You've got to do a lot of interviews. You've got to figure all these things out. And that was one very simple way of showing them that it's actually, if you have high turnover, it's actually very costly. And so that's partly what, part of what we do, right, is showing organizations. Now, not everything can be converted into a cost, and not everything should be converted into a cost to convince organizations to do the right thing. Uh, but in our profession, that's a lot of what we do. Sometimes that's the only way to convince um, an employer or you know, a business owner. And um, there is quite a bit of data and evidence, whether it's absenteeism, turnover, individual productivity, um, you know, uh, like negativism at work. Like there are there are ways that you can quantify, um, which can you know increase your argument. Should we move to the next next one? Okay. So, is this good so far? Is this okay? This is uh, and I and our, our people online. Hopefully, the these are some of the questions that you might be thinking as well. I'm, you know, we can't interact with you directly, but hopefully, some of the questions relate to uh, what you're interested in. So the second question was. Um, what are the top three factors that feed into well-being at work? How might these vary according to individual circumstances? So individuals at work, their interactions, workplace structures and dynamics, and groups that people belong to, et cetera. Do you, do you want me to start? Do you guys want to start? OK, I'll start with this one. So, um, so this is one where I thought I would go into the literature a little bit. And there's a theory that, that really resonated with me. I read it about, well, for me, everything is about 15 years ago. So, um, and it's called self-determination theory. And, it and it's got some pretty good research um, behind it. And it's also been uh, demonstrated cross-culturally. So I think it's kind of an interesting theory. And that would suggest that it's kind of a human condition type of, type of theory. Um, although, obviously, more research is always um, necessary. So, um, and it's Desi and Ryan, Ed Desi. And I can't remember Ryan's first name, but that, the last name's Ryan. And so basically, they say that you know, people feel self-determined, which is kind of tied into engagement or feeling you know, motivated. Um, when three conditions exist, and sense of competence, sense of autonomy, and sense of relatedness. And so when I think about the workplace, I think these are very relevant. So sense of competence is, do you really feel like you can meet the challenges in your role? Do you feel like you have that capability? Um, you know, and some things might be a stretch, you know, it might be a challenge, but you feel that you can actually you know, meet the demands of your role. And if you think about it, that's very motivational, right? If you feel like if you feel like you're in over your head, then that can be really, really, really tough. But if you feel like, okay, I'm stretched a little bit, I'm pushed a little bit, I got a lot of deadlines. This is a very busy time of the year for many of us. Um, but you feel like you can get through it. That gives you a sense of competence, and that's positive. Um, sense of autonomy is whether you have some control over what's what's happening. How much are other people, you know, um, driving what you have to do? You know. And so if you feel like you at least have some control, often we can't, you know, we probably deal with a lot of emails, so we don't have a lot of control over the volume of emails, but maybe you can control prioritizing some over others. You know, maybe you have some, you can, you can control your deadlines a little bit. But that control, that sense of control is also important. Uh, the worst case scenario is something where you have no control and, you know, every day, at, say at the end of the workday, whether that's 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock for you or whatever, someone's coming in and giving you more stuff. And you're like, wait a minute, I was hoping to go home. Maybe I have a, a function with a family member or whatnot. And that's a really difficult situation because you have no control, right? And then the last one's relatedness. And that's how we feel connected to other people. So even if you have competence and autonomy, they're kind of more on, you know, on your side and individually. The sense of relatedness is you feel connected to people you're working with, you know? Um, and so those are three factors that they talk about, and, and they all seem to relate to well-being at work. So that's kind of, okay, so we'll turn it over to the panel. So kind of building on what Peter said, um, the control is a, is a really important aspect. If we look at some of the research around job demands and control, control can actually 
um, has really significant impacts on long-term health and well-being. Um, so not only control in terms of the type of work you're doing, but when and where it's completed. So if you are able to take time in the afternoon to go and meet another, like a family obligation, for example, those kinds of things can have a significant impact on well-being. Um, and related to relatedness, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about social support. So having uh, those networks inside and outside the organization. So inside the organization, coworkers, supervisors, and the general organization itself, so perceptions of organizational support um, are really important within, within the walls of work. But outside of that, uh, friends, family members, um, spouse or partner, uh, community members, those kinds of people are really important too. And part of well-being is recognizing the nature of the stress that you're experiencing and seeking out the right type of support from the right person in that situation. So oftentimes we're not really good at reflecting on what our needs are at the, at the moment and communicating that to others. But that connection is really important. So making sure that you have a broad network that you can reach out to for different things that are going on in your life um, to make sure that you're getting the right kind of support that you need in that situation. So if you're experiencing a barrier at work and you know that a colleague has gone through it, they can provide you with some advice in that situation. But if you just had a really hard day, maybe you've got a lot of family demands at the same time, venting to um, your, your loved ones at home might be the best way to handle it, right? So it's really tying that support that you're seeking from others to the nature of the stress that you're experiencing. Um, and the last one I, I was really reflecting on was the impact of the culture and the climate of the organization. Um, and, and those impacts on well-being. So what values the organization has, but then in also the policies and procedures that are enacted. So for example, if the organization itself really values camaraderie and teamwork, but um, uh, recognizes uh, and rewards individuals based on individual performance, there can be some misalignment there that can cause some stress. So sometimes too, there are these external pressures that come in and it's learning how to manage and work within those structures and understanding them that can have an impact on well-being. Great. So um, I agree with everything that's already been said. Um, I think one thing that's interesting is when we look at uh, people's well-being and we try to ask the question, um, the things that we tend to gravitate to as you know natural answers are things like, oh, well, it's the person's resilience or the person's ability to cope with stress or you know maybe it's how optimistic they are. <laughs> um, and I think that we tend to look at the person as the source of well-being because we naturally think of you know people. Um, being responsible for, for their own fate or um, the circumstances that they're in. And so I think taking a, a bit more of a contextualized perspective, so looking at the situations that people are placed in at work and then looking at the work environment like organizational culture and, and the policies um, is really important. So I, I've worked with an organization um, actually in the healthcare industry where they thought that the solution to their employees' well-being was to um, train everybody on mindfulness. And so, um, of course, that, that can help and it can help some people. Um, but if the demands at work are you know, incredibly high, the workload is unmanageable, um, there's tons of stress, people don't have time to even go to the bathroom, they cannot take care of themselves, they, they bring their work home, um, learning to meditate um, for a few minutes each day is not going to solve all of those problems that are causing so much um, stress for people um, and negatively affecting their well-being. So I would say it's important for us to look at what people can do to, to manage um, what they have control of. So how much autonomy do they have? Like So to manage what they can manage, to draw on the resources that they can draw on, but that workplaces really put the thought and effort into considering what kind of context are we putting our employees into so that they're, they're thing, something like workload is manageable. And just to add to that, unfortunately, one of our challenges, a lot of organizations you know, think that if they create a little training program or a little mindfulness initiative, um, I mean, it definitely helps, and it's, not, it's, not, um, it's good that they're thinking that way, but sometimes they need to look at more structural or organizational factors, and that's a, that's a harder you know, thing to solve, and it takes a lot more effort. So we often, I find, struggle with organizations that want sort of the quick fix kind of solution to say, well, we've, we've figured this out. But really, as Leanne was saying, often it's it's a deeper structural, organizational, you know, problem that you know you, we need to encourage them to actually explore more deeply, right? Because it's fairly easy to put together a quick little program and to say, okay, we've got this. Um, but if that's not addressing bigger issues in the organization, then you know, it might help a little bit, but it's not really going to help in the long term. Uh, questions for this one? Oh, 
perfect. So I really like that model, first of all. Um, I can really uh, visualize and attach not only myself, but other positions to the competence control and the relationships. And I can see how hiring and practices, et cetera, need to uh, be really mindful of those. But what about positions and hires that have been here for eons and years, et cetera? Um, it made me think of that, and it also made me think of positions where particularly control is not even part of the job description. So my, I guess, moving farther with my thought process, my question finally comes to, um, are the three necessary for wellness, or with the lack of one, is it still achievable? Uh, or would you challenge it and say, no, that again, all three are achievable? All right. Oh, you want me to? <laughs> okay. That was a tough question. It's yours, Peter. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did start, I did offer the theory, so I guess it kind of <laughs> makes me obligated to try to answer it. Um, so let me start with the, with the first part, the first question. And actually, that, because I, um, I do think it's the, there's two, two separate issues. So one is, one of the things that I've noticed about good leaders, so I do a lot of work with leaders, and one of the things that I've noticed is good leaders actually are able to get the best from every person that works for them. And, and, and that may not be the same best for every person, but they're able to get the best from each person. And so the university is kind of a, a unique place in that we have people that have been here a long time, right? We have unionized environments. And so, and sometimes as a manager, you might inherit someone who you know has been difficult or is difficult, right? And and you know and in corporations that 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 does happen, but a little bit less so. Um, and usually those people get restructured out, right? So and what I find fascinating about that is nobody ever really wants to have the conversation with the person. They just restructure them out and oh well, your job is no longer viable in the organization, and the person leaves, and they have some vague sense that maybe they weren't, you know, there's other reasons for them to go, but it's all done. And so. But I think good leaders are able to find that, to figure that out. Um, and I think to try to have good conversations with that person. So not to just focus on their faults, but to have a good conversation about what, you know, um, what they can do in their role that might be more effective than what they're doing now. You know? um, but all in the mindset of trying to make sure that you get the most from them, given that they might not be in the best role for them, but you know, you've got them and you, know, you want to give them a sense of competence. And now the autonomy one is, you're right, sometimes there are roles which you know, you don't have any control over it. Um, you know, my, I guess my response to that would be, I think, I think that you don't necessarily have to have all three. It's best if you have all three. Um, when I think about the, the relationships, I think relatedness is the smallest effect size of the, of the three. Um, but I, I don't, so it's great if you have all three, but I think you can get some benefits with say two of the three. Uh, but maybe you can explore ways that can give them more control within certain parameters, right? So, um, like I know when working with people who have a lot of tight deadlines, um, at least knowing what's coming and knowing, yeah, you planning your day can be very powerful, right? Especially if you have kids or you have other obligations outside of work. So it might be that they can, you know, control some of that. You know what I mean? So maybe there are ways to tweak it tweak the control a little bit, even though, yes, deadlines are there. Like, I know, do you have anyone here who's in the registrar? I know there's, I don't know, create, you know, like, you know, like with, with us too, there are times when there's crazy deadlines. At the end of the semester, we have to get our grades in. It's kind of an unmovable deadline, right? Um, but maybe there are ways to, to think about control, maybe in a more nuanced way or in more just specific situations, or to have a conversation with the person to say, we can't change a lot of this, but if there were a few things we could tweak for you around control, what would work? Do you know what I mean? And again, maybe end of the day thing or something like that. Maybe there's a way of giving them something. Um, so just adding on your last point there, I would say that um, sometimes people have a, uh, a need, um, so the need for, I think the need for control reflects a few things. So one is some ability to, you know, literally control your environment, but part of it is also predictability. And then part of it is to feel like others understand what your needs are and where you're coming from and what you're experiencing. And so even if you can't actually have um, 
control over the decision-making process, to feel like you've got voice, and that um, that your perspective is being recognized, I think can help in those in those instances. Okay, another question. Are we, are we on time for that one? Yeah, we can take one more. Question. One more question on this one. Okay. I'm happy to come to the back. I hope this isn't too um, off topic, but it was a conversation in my office this morning, so I'm just interested to hear what you folks have to say about it. Um, when you're speaking about control, what arguments would you give for the work from home idea? Um, and I obviously there's difficulties in implementing that for a number of reasons, but in a perspective of wellness, how do you think working from home would benefit people or hinder people? Um, so there is a lot of controversy around flex time and these flexible working arrangements in terms of what organizations have liked to do in practice versus kind of what's coming through in the research. So there is some research to support um, people's perceptions of control and the ability to say complete something in the evening so that way they can pick up their child from school, things like that, um, in terms of different well-being outcomes. Uh, so there are there is support for that. Um, whether or not that's feasible based on the type of work that's being done is always a challenge. So uh, if, if it's really kind of a collaborative sense and everyone needs to be in the same uh, physical space in order to complete the work, it's a little bit challenging there to make the argument. But if ever there is an opportunity, giving people that sense of uh, control in terms of what time they complete their work at and where they do it, as long as the work gets done at the end of the day, for the most part, that's the argument that uh, employers are worried about. Um, but really just depends on kind of some of the constraints around there, but there are a lot of positives for people having the choice in terms of when and where they complete their work. Uh, maybe I'll just add, so one thing that, I, that I've um, noticed over the many years, and I've with these kinds of conversations, is managers really don't like when their workers are not visible. They call it FaceTime. And I think it's just because we, you know, if, if, if you're all in the room here, and you're, I can, you're all attending to me, I don't know if our web people are multitasking and watching Netflix right now. Um, and so, so we, have, we put a lot of trust in the fact that we can see people and see what they're, what they're doing, right? So as a manager, you feel better. I, like I know you're at your desk. And so you, you know, now, that doesn't necessarily mean you're at your desk not you know, watching Netflix and clicking you know, the screen when I come by. But anyways, we managers, we have a real trust in that. Um, but you know, there's a lot of, there are pros and cons to working at home, and there's a lots of things around optimal situations of working at home, like obviously um, they say having a, a home office and getting into the office and whatnot. Um, but you could also do like laundry on a break at home, right? Which isn't, just, you take breaks at work, you could do that too. Um, so I think that it's, it's a good strategy. The technology is really making it a lot more available for many, many people. Uh, there are some, uh, there's some research to suggest that people can feel isolated, so usually the best strategies that I've seen are a mixed model strategy where you at least spend maybe one or two days at work and then you work at home. So it's not exclusively at home, but um, you have some time at work. Because also career, like relationships that are important for your career um, are constrained if you're at home all the time. Mm -hmm. So I think it's one of those things where we're seeing a lot more of it. Uh, I think it needs to make sense for the role and the relationship with your manager um, and for you. And um, like certainly if, if you live in Guelph and you commute to the university, the commuting benefit or the commuting trade-off isn't really there. But if you live in Guelph and you work in Toronto, you know, you could save several hours off of your day by working at home. So right away there, there's a productivity benefit if you took those three hours sitting in the car and adding stress um, to working at home. So, um, but there is a lot of research on that now. So that's, mm -hmm. um, there is a lot of stuff that you can look at to, uh, if you want to make an argument to your manager or whatever, but there is a lot of stuff out there on this. And I, I think in general it's a good, if you, the more flexibility we give people, I think, uh, I think the better. Mm -hmm. yep. One more or we're, how are we doing? Sure. Oh, okay. It's, fle it's flexible, it's flexible. So just growing off of that, when you, um, endorsing some things about wellness, particularly let's narrow in on flexible work schedules, 
uh, again, some different positions can and cannot do that. So uh, as we start to talk about wellness in a very progressive way, which is awesome, uh, but um, in itself, uh, my, my question is to give the benefit to some and not others, where then is the advantage for personalization of wellness when it excludes equity or fairness across, across and the comparison that naturally happens between employee to employee? You're not making this easy for us, are you? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Leanne, awesome. Um, so I would say that a big factor in the workplace is people's perceptions of justice. Um, and so justice in terms of what people get, right? So are, are you getting some perk that I'm not getting? Um, as well as perceptions of the fairness of the procedures that are used to, to make these decisions. So is there consistency across people? Is there bias? Do people have voice and input into the decision making? Is there a way to correct things? Does it seem ethical and right? Um, or do people think that um, people are being treated in, in a partial um, way? Um, and then finally, are people being given explanations and information around the decisions that are being made or the, the decision making process? So. Um, you know, how, what, what's most fair, right? Should everyone be treated the exact same regardless of their circumstances or should we have more flexibility in terms of um, how people are treated because they do have different situations? So I'm sorry, you work on this project, so flex time's not an option for you. You're, you're, uh, you, you're the, your roles, we could have you either from, you know, eight to four or nine to five or 10 to six and, and that would be possible. So I think, um, I think you know, just, the exact same treatment isn't necessarily what's most logical. Um, and so if people know what the procedures are, they know that they can have some input into them, um, an explanation is given for why some people can be treated in one way and other people are going to be treated in another way, then I think people have got greater tolerance for the fact that not everyone gets the exact same thing. I think just building on that, it's when, when the processes aren't clear and people are led to infer, well, that person's receiving some sort of perk that I'm not. So as long as the, the process is clearly laid out um, and as Leanne said, people have voice in terms of what those, what those processes look like, um, that's the benefit and that's where we get some of the benefits for everyone uh, because we all know that certain situations come up that you know, maybe someone has family demands or elder care responsibilities that come up and we can be compassionate for one another um, without really having to delve into what that personal situation is, but we've helped create those policies that make it accessible for people when they need it and that's really the benefit is when it's transparent. Okay, so why don't we move on and then, okay. So uh, the next question was, what are some false beliefs or erroneous strategies that people often think will improve their personal well-being? Um, so I think one of the major ones that comes up uh, relates to this idea of balance and that it's this end state that at one point you can achieve when really it's an ongoing process and that's something we're really kind of working through. Um, there is no universal definition of balance. It's really depends, it really depends on the individual and the context. So the different demands that you have going on but also the resources that you have available to you at that time. Um, so really not trying to see it as some sort of goal to achieve at some point if you work hard enough or if you get through that next project. Um, but really looking at, okay, what does balance for me mean this week, right, versus next month, versus next year. So creating a definition for yourself and coming back to it and feeling comfortable revising it as necessary. I think the other um, false belief is that some coping strategies are better than others or that there are some that are just generally good and some that are generally bad. Coping is really situational, so there's some days when I know that denial and procrastination are the way that I'm going to get through it. Uh, is that a great long-term strategy? No. But uh, it's seeing that at some point it's a means to an end and that at, when it st stops working for me, I reevaluate and think about the long-term well-being aspect and maybe try a different strategy then. But knowing that there are no inherently bad things, it just might be what you need to get through that moment, that stressor, that day, that week, and then you can reevaluate and change as necessary. Um, so 
I hear a lot of people say that um, they can't, they, ca they don't have time to sleep, uh, they don't have time to take a vacation, they uh, don't have time to go work out, um, they don't have time to watch TV, spend time with their kids, like, you know, because they need to get this done. And, and I know I'm supposed to be doing those things, but what's really stressing me out is this workload. And so I need to address my workload and I need to get this project done and, you know, and then I'll be okay. But once you get that one done, there's the next one and the next one and the next one. Um, so I would say, uh, you know, thinking that if, if you can attack your workload, your problems are going to go away with stress, I would say would be an erroneous strategy. Um, another one that I see people, you know, certainly not myself, is uh, perfectionism. Um, so I think a lot of people deal with the anxiety um, um, and that sense of, you know, accountability or people looking over your shoulder or um, it's like that if, if, we're, if we're just good enough and we perform highly enough and we're competent enough and we're well prepared enough that that's somehow going to make us bulletproof um, to then, you know, anxiety or feedback that we might get from others. and. Um, and then you just put so much time and energy into trying to control a situation that you actually, in the end, aren't going to be able to control perfectly. So I would say that's another erroneous strategy. Um, and then the last one would be um, thinking that it has to be you, right? That you can't say no to things, that you have to take on every um, request. Um, and that when you are recognizing that you are getting overloaded, that you can't back out. Right, it's like I've said yes to this, and I'm gonna, and I'm gonna disappoint them, and and I, I can't manage um, my roles and responsibilities, um, and so uh, to kn to know that it doesn't have to be you, and you know we're all everybody's the same, right? Like we all have health things hit us, we have emergencies in our families, um, you know life life can be really tough. And everybody knows that about themselves, and so they know that about their coworkers. And so to, to know that you can actually reach out for help at work, I think, is, is important. You stole mine. Oh, sorry. It's okay. It's all right. <laughs> I thought Grace would, because we're doing, we're doing a lot of work with first responders. And one of the things that we found was quite interesting uh, with police officers is that after they've experienced a traumatic event, and so this their definition of trauma, so not ours, theirs, so they felt it was traumatic. Um, the, about almost half of them felt they could deal with it on their own. And so in psychology, once we get into the term trauma, or, you know, or post-traumatic stress disorder, we kind of know that's not something that you're expected to deal with on your own. And yet, almost half felt like they could deal with it on, your own, on their own. So, so I think that's kind of, to, just to build on what, you know, what Leanne already said, that's, that's an erroneous assumption and strategy, right? That, and also tied to that, I think, is that we're somehow weak if we have to seek help from others, mm -hmm. right? That there's a negative judgment that we put on ourselves as a result of that. And, um, and so the unfortunate thing is often people don't do that. And as Grace said, then they end up trying whatever they can, whether those strategies are adaptive or not adaptive, right? So, so I think, uh, you know, um, being, recognizing where you're at and being open to asking for help, um, I think is something that we, we all need to do. And, um, and again, it's not like don't, don't ask for help for everything, but figure out where you're at and what you can manage on your own. But then if you realize you're in over your head, then, you know, then seek help. And you know what's amazing is that, and I, it's, it's interesting because our department, our, we've gone through a number of things in the last few years, a, lo a number of us. And it it's, ties back to the relatedness, you know, when, when you ask for help. And, it, and it's not you're asking a huge, you think you're asking a, a lot for other people, but We've been able to distribute things um, so there's only a little impact on each person, and it, it feels amazing because all of a sudden you feel, wow, wow, like this actually, this, this worked out, you know? Um, so I think, I think we hold ourselves back more often than we should, and we put ourselves through a lot more worse than we should before we actually um, go and talk to others and, and, and seek some help. And there's a, a remarkable number of resources out there, whether it's your partner, you know, friends at work, friends outside of work. I mean, this is what Grace and I are doing research on, looking at how first responders, where they go for help. And it's not necessarily just EAP. There's a whole range of different um, options out there. And I think having good relationships with people allows you to actually draw on those relationships when you need to, and then also allows you to be a support for them, right? So I think it, it works both ways. Um, so questions, comments? I guess one of my questions, uh, especially kind of going off what you were asking Peter about or talking about with reaching out and looking for help, 
how do you or how would you encourage that because a lot of things like I find like that is cultural like western masculine culture very if you ask for help you're weak etc so how do you deal with cultural differences not so much even with that example but trying to balance that in wellness good question do You know, guys, okay, so, <laughs> well, uh, it's okay. It's okay. I do like to talk about this stuff. So there's a book, and I'm trying to remember the title. Um, it has Invisible Men in the title. So because that's one, the first thing I want to touch on is that um, men are particularly bad at seeking um, social support. So that's kind of interesting, and, that's just, and I think maybe because of masculinity, perceptions of norms, and there's a real, that book is really good. It's, it's got an invisible man in the title. It's written by a clinical psychologist in the US. Um, and, um, and so, and Leanne's gonna laugh because I don't, I've told her about this story. I started a little project, just a personal project a few years ago because obviously I do research in this area and I've, I've not been historically very good at asking for help either, right? So, and I do kind of think we should apply what we learn to ourselves to try to be as authentic as we can, you know. And so I started what I called the Sensitive Man Project. So you're going to laugh, and maybe there's people laughing online too. And what this basically was, in my circle of friends who are men, so I play sports and you know, whatever, I just started testing the waters to see which of those men, if I asked for some help about something with, would be receptive. Because you kind of know, if you think about people that are in your circle, right, in your circle of you might already have a sense, well, I would never, ever kind of open up some kind of thing with this person because, boy, you know, I, right? So I just started testing the waters in a very safe way, just sort of started asking them questions. Just so, so how's it going? You know, how is this? How is that? Just to see if I could even engage the conversation as a way of sort of pushing the boundaries because I think sometimes we think, well, if I asked that person for help or even shared something personal with them of a, of a sensitive nature, you know, that would be a really bad thing to do, right? Like I'd get kicked off the hockey team or whatever. So, and what I found was that, yeah, there were, there were people that I didn't approach at all because I thought, yeah, there's no way. And then there were some that I thought, yes, and it was reinforced. And, the, and then the, some in the middle, I was surprised, you know? Um, and in fact, a bunch of us from hockey have a Sunday morning coffee group. And it's incredible what we actually talk about all kinds of stuff that, that most men don't talk about. So, so I think part of it is, you know, trying to find that, you know, find those people in your network that, that might be able to do that. And it's not going to be everybody. Um, but that's one way, I think, of, of trying to shift that, you know. Because uh, if you don't take an active role in trying to shift it, and, it, and if you think about it, I'm not, I'm risk averse, right? So I didn't just throw myself out there and I'm in the dressing room and say, hey, everybody, you know, this happened to me, you know, help, right? Uh, that probably wouldn't have gone well, but um, I did it in little ways, just to kind of explore without risking myself. Now maybe you can take more risks if you're less risk averse than I am, but, but it seemed to be a good way of just testing the waters. And that's what that book talks about, is the fact that men in particular don't do a very good job. We socialize a lot and we spend a lot of time with other men, but we tend to talk to our partners or female friends more about stuff than we do our male friends which I find quite, quite fascinating. And so there's a whole resource there that we're not really making use of. So that, that was the first part. Was, does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. yeah? Okay. Do you, guys, do you have anything to add? Well. And you can confirm, it's, right? It's kind I, of off So Peter had me read this book. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I've, I've got two young boys. So one is six and one is nine. Um, and after reading the book, like it got me thinking about um, the ways in which we discourage um, boys and men from expressing their emotions. And, um, you know, so, you know, I'm, I'm a psychologist. I'm always trying to get them to, you know, regulate their emotions and be able to express themselves and label things. But I came to realize that I'm actually um, am probably showing a, quite a bit of impatience when they get upset about things that I think that they don't need to get upset with, and yet I don't seem to have the same impatience about their anger, right? So it's like anger's expected um, negative, you know, male emotions, whereas um, being sad or upset or distressed, uh, not so much. And so I would just say that, you know, so yes, men should be trying to, you know, take the risks and support each other, but that women also then have to check to see how they are responding when men do um, break the, the stereotypical behavior. So 
Other questions? How are we doing for time? We're okay? Have I messed up the whole session? Oh my, okay. Wow, wow. Okay, well, you're fired, Grace. I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> no, that's okay. Hopefully this has been, been helpful. You know, obviously I think there's been good questions and good discussion. Um, okay, so let's move to the last one, because since we've got five minutes left. Um, so what do we need to focus on in order to enact positive change for our own well-being? I think one of the biggest things is carving out time to actively reflect on what well-being means for, for ourselves. Um, so thinking about our current obligations, our priorities, our values, what we find fulfilling and engaging, um, really spending some quality time thinking about those things and revisiting it over time. So thinking about what that definition of balance and well-being might be for you and then coming back to it whenever there are changes and just, just as a check-in. Um, so it might be something that you actually draft that you share with uh, you know, a, a trusted loved one or something like that to hold you accountable. Um, but that you do regular check-ins for yourself because we don't really carve out time for our, our own well-being in that, in that sense. So taking that active role. And then learning to say no to things. This is something that I personally have found very challenging. Um, but over the past years, I've really worked on picking the projects that were most important to me and focusing on being able to give my whole self, my, my best self to those things. Um, because we will always have new opportunities, new things that come up, but choosing the things that were most important to me and that I found most value in and not feeling guilty about it was the challenge. So that's an active struggle that I've worked on. But uh, again, it comes with me kind of constantly checking in and reevaluating and, and working through those feelings. Um, I, w I would say um, focusing, so often it's really easy to think about what it is that we haven't accomplished, right? So the deadlines that we missed or all of the work that's on our desk that we haven't tackled yet, um, you know, the to-do list that, like, oh, I didn't do that, oh, and I didn't do that, but to, to change focus sometimes to um, think about the things that we have accomplished um, and to be able to get, um, so that sense of comp uh, competence or, um, efficacy from seeing the things that, w that we have gotten done. I think, and I agree, I agree wholeheartedly with both of those comments. I think what I would add is, and I've been myself working a lot on acceptance lately, um, and accepting that, that each of us is a work in progress, you know, that, um, that we're going to make mistakes, you know, that we're going to struggle with things, and that's okay, you know, and it, it doesn't mean you're going to give up, you're going to try, but recognizing that, you know, we are a work in progress. And uh, that probably is our, really what our life journey is about, right, is, is learning and developing. So why don't we open it up for any, any question now since we've got just a few minutes left. Questions, comments? So we've talked a lot about quality relationships and feeling connected at work. And I think more and more we live in, you know, communities where we feel a bit more isolated. We don't have big families around us. We've got both uh, parents that tend to be working. And so we rely, I think, a lot more in the workplace to have that sense of satisfaction from relationships. And so I'm always curious about how do we help leaders to understand the kind of cr critical role that they play in fostering those kind of positive relationships between themselves and their staff, as well as you know within their teams, um, because I find a lot of the time there's still a focus on you know well-being being associated with programs or policies, um, but the quality relationships really have a big impact. And I'll, I'll use the oversighted you know uh, research finding that most people leave their bosses, not organizations. Um, so how do we help managers understand then this world where we're constantly bombarded with all the tasks? to pay attention to the relationships as well. And that really impacts not only well-being, but performance. So just wondering what your experience is with organizations or research would say about that. Catherine's questions are just getting tougher <laughs> all the time. <laughs> Do one of you want to start with that? Uh, I, well, I, I, okay, so um, uh, it's, I think it's tough. So one of the things that, I, that, that has changed in the managerial role over the last, let's say, 50 years is that managers are doing a lot more task-based work. So that's part of the problem, right? Because then managers are supposed to manage and plan and develop strategy and budget and vision and lead the people, but they're also doing a lot more task-based work. It seems to be something in all organizations doing a lot more tasks. And so, you know, there's a, it was a very early model of leadership based in uh, at, at Ohio State University called uh, Ohio State, um, Anyways, Ohio State leadership model. Anyways, it's anyways, it's um, and they and there were two fact. There basically is two factors. 
initiating structure and consideration. And I think of, I also sort of think of it as task-based and people-based, right? And I tend to think about almost everything that way. It's a bit, bit of a blunt kind of way of doing it. And so what happens is when you got managers focusing more on just getting the stuff done, they don't think about the people side of things. And so part of it, what I find when, when I'm talking to leaders, is I try to you know, let them to communicate the people side. And often when they're having problems, it's because they haven't invested the time in the people side, right? And so it's really trying to shift that conversation and getting them to understand that the, the managerial role or the leadership role actually has these two pieces, right? And so there's the stuff you gotta do that feels like tasks, budget, you know, things, specific things. But this people side is, is part of that equation. And so getting them to at least recognize that and trying to tie it into problems that they may have encountered and getting them to understand that it's probably because they haven't invested the time that they should have in doing those things with their people. So, anyone add anything? Well, I guess I would just add that people the leaders need to be trained in how to deal with the most tricky problems on the people side, right? So the difficult employees, the conflict situations, um, and if, if you haven't had the training, then it can seem completely daunting um, to, ha you know, how, how do you take on these, these issues? And so I think that's why it also gets neglected is because people actually don't know how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. So I would say the importance of leaders getting that training. Yeah, okay. And how, how are we for time? We're, we're, all, we're right on? Yeah. Maybe one last, maybe one last like comment. So then that otherwise question then we begs a response. So any any last final comment? And there are evaluations coming out. So um, if you can fill those out, Sarah would really appreciate it. So any last comment? Anybody? Panel? Well, any, so thank you very much for coming. I hope that this was um, was helpful. You know, I think our goals were just to, you know, there, are, there hopefully there were some ideas or solutions or tips that, that you took away. Um, this is important stuff, but we also recognize it's complex and, um, you know, hopefully um, some of the discussion was, was helpful for you. So thank you for coming. <laughs>